हेलो सलाम शलोम नमस्ते सचिकाल अलोहा ओला चाओ बाजार बुना प्रेवियत एंड रबु है इट्स रियली रियली गुड टू बी विथ यू अगैन एंड आई एम सो हैप्पी यू आर जॉइनिंग अस एंड आई नो यू विल बी रियली हैप्पी यू आर जॉइनिंग अस बिकॉज़ वी हैव अ वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट joining us today and that is Francine Julien. Welcome Francine. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing fabulously and feeling very happy to be with a fellow uh change making expert because did I mention Francine is a warrior princess of personal change? Yes, she is. And Francine tell us more. about who you are and what you do. I am Francine Julie, the warrior princess of personal change. I'm an author and a speaker. I share tools that make change easier. If you look right behind me here, you'll see one of the tools I share. That's the book I wrote on how to start your own personal change process. love it absolutely love it ah oh, we love making change more easy here and more fun too which i know yes. you do too cuz if you're not having fun you're not doing it right yes yes it's like what kind of easy change would it be that's not also fun <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay, so uh Francine, uh you are a warrior princess of personal change and you help your clients in lots and lots of amazing ways to create change in their lives. What is one of the most um uh significant ways or areas in which you love to help your clients make change? Making it simple. A lot of people overthink it and I know that's where I started when I was writing this book. I was in a doctoral program for change management in the industri- in industrial setting in the military. I was in the military and I also worked change management in the corporate world helping employees get over change. Uh mm-hmm. but my when it was time for me to change i overthought it i overcomplicated it and i avoided it yeah because it was just hard i realized that the beginning of making change easy and fun is quieting the mind and mm-hmm. believe it or not getting proper rest yes that is so true that is so true cuz a well rested mind and body is naturally also more calm and more able to take on the challenges of the day with a positive energy and attitude yes because when you sleep all those little neurons in your brain are cleaning and excreting and rearranging it's almost like think of it in an office with the old fashioned filing system when you go to sleep somebody goes and cleans up all your files and puts everything in the right order and that's what's happening in your brain if you don't sleep that's when you find that messy file where the a's are mixed in with the n's and the p's are over on top of the cabinet and how can you find anything when you're especially for students if you pull an all nighter before a test your brain does not have time to file all this information so you'll be sitting there taking your test i know i read that but what i can't remember sleep it's the most primary thing you need in your life right after oxygen and food. Mm. True, true, true. 
You know, we could like just do a whole episode on that. Yes. Because I share tools that help you sleep better too. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing. You know, but, uh, I I would love to do a whole episode on that with you. And I think just for today, though, let's talk about yeah. something a little different because you know, one of the reasons that I really connected with you, Francine, is because of how you help women embrace their true natural beauty. Tell me a little bit more about that. Like, uh, what's the problem that you are seeing? Um, and um, yeah, like, what made you jump into that area of creating personal change? Hey, thanks for tuning into this episode. Hope you're getting value out of it. For your information, this episode has been sponsored by the Happiness 101 program. Are you a change maker, coach, trainer, or healer? Are chains of fear holding you back from making the impact and income you desire? Using a unique combination of positive psychology and the spiritual wisdom of our most effective change makers, the Happiness 101 program helps you break through your limiting beliefs and manifest the abundance and success you desire with fun and ease. Interested? Book a free Happiness 101 exploration call with me, your happiness expert, Samya Vano. Just use my online calendar link in the show notes. Now back to the show. Well, like I told you before, when I was in my doctoral program and I was doing the research on corporate change, I weighed 200 pounds. I was unhealthy. I was taking hands full of medication. And I was looking for that easy fix, that magic pill. I was looking for that diet guru to just give me a pill to take to help me lose all the weight and get healthy. Mm. And I had all the knowledge on how to be healthy, healthy, but I thought I needed all those unhealthy habits to cope with being unhappy. Because, and the reason I was unhappy is because I was overweight and unhealthy. It was a vicious cycle. Mm. It's when I realized that when our lives feel out of control, we form habits that help us feel like we're in control. Mm. So when our lives are out of control, what's the first thing, the easiest thing we do? We go to comfort food. Mm. Well, for me... My comfort food was the cheese and the crackers and the macaroni and cheese and everything else that was just so bad for me. Not only bad for uh, an overweight person, but bad for me because of uh, food sensitivities and allergies that I didn't know about. I drank way too much. Mm. I took, like I said, lots of medicine. And then I started taking all these herbal supplements on top of it. My liver did not know what to do. And it, everything started backing up to the point where I had this full body rash. Now, add to that the severe stress of going through a doctoral program and not liking my job. Did you know that stress compounds an unhealthy lifestyle, that if you reduce your stress, your life won't feel as out of control and you won't reach for those comfort habits. Yeah. But when you're stuck in that rut, when you're stuck in what I call the yucks, you can't see because you got a tree right there covering that forest. Yeah. All you could see is, oh, I got off of work and I'm so tired. I'll take a nap until dinner time. 
Then you get up and you pop that first cork on that first bottle of wine. You start drinking that wine. Oh, I feel more relaxed now. I feel better. And it's dinner time. Do you reach for a carrot and a piece of chicken breast? No. I'm going to make this big old pot of ooey gooey cheesy mess or a pizza or something that says warm and comfort. Yeah. And then what happens? You've just stressed your whole digestive system. You've stressed your body. You're drunk, so you don't care. And then what I found myself doing is later in the evening, I was making more unhealthy food choices when I wasn't even hungry. I just wanted to put something in my mouth to make me more comfortable. Yes. So when I say change, I'm not saying go on a diet and lose weight. I'm saying find what is making you uncomfortable, then find the root cause of that. Because chances are, whatever the symptom is, is just on the surface. You have to dive down and you do that with self-reflection. Find the root cause. And then when you eliminate that root cause, it's a piece of cake to say, you literally say, I don't need that piece of cake anymore. I want what's healthy for my body. Yes. Yes, that is so true. That is so true. I, you know, just last year I was working with a coach uh, that I, you know, signed up with to coach me. And uh, her area uh, of specialization is intuitive eating, uh, meaning that uh, that is her approach to helping um, people. Uh, develop a better lifestyle and a better relationship with regards to their food. And one of the core aspects or ideas behind intuitive eating is that you need to learn to respect and trust your body because your body has an amazing innate intelligence. And uh, what happens is that when we're stressed, when we're unhappy, we don't know how to cope uh, with these things in a healthy manner. We take on all of these negative, unhealthy habits. And it's sort of, um, it's sort of like, it's a way of, um, uh, you know, you sort of, um, so then, you know, what happens is that the body has to adjust. Uh, in the the way that it functions to cope with what you're putting it through in terms of the stress and this and that. And so then, you know, that obviously uh, creates illness and disease. I mean, the body's doing its best to help you cope, but, you know, there is an optimal way for it to function and there's like an optimal diet for it and so on and so forth. And so part of the intuitive eating process that I was learning was, okay, how do you reset, you know, so that you're, you're able to listen to what your body really needs and what it really wants, and then you give it what it really needs and what it really wants and trust, you know, you rebuild your trust in your body and that it will guide you in the right direction for you back to a place of health and wellness and happiness if you learn to listen to it really truly and um, just like you were sharing one of the biggest impacts that i experienced um, as a result of going through this intuitive eating uh, program was that before i used to feel very out of control of what I ate and how much I ate. Like I had, I had this notorious um, reputation in my family where <laughs> like I, I, I couldn't just eat a little bit of anything, you know, it was like yeah. <laughs> shoveling, shoveling, shoveling and lots and lots of whatever it was that I was eating. 
And uh, um, ever since I've started to eat more consciously and with more awareness of what my body actually feels when I eat, uh, it's amazing how um, I transitioned to a point where I was like, oh, I would pick up a cookie, I'd eat maybe like 25% of it, and I'd be like, this was good so far, but the next bite isn't not so good anymore in the sense that my body's like, we're done. We don't want more. We don't need more. And then if you keep eating more, actually, it doesn't continue to make you feel good like the first few bites did. And so I learned to stop. And um, and, and and I could stop. I can stop. And I actually really enjoy everything that I eat now a whole lot more because I'm not just um, you know, eating on impulse and without awareness of how it's really making me feel, uh, even over the course of eating a single cookie. <laughs> My husband and I are amazed by how m all the changes I've made have changed us as a couple, too. Mm. We used to have two one-pound steaks great big baked potato and a salad and bread and then another vegetable, maybe corn or corn or something. Now we share one steak. I have some broccoli. He has whatever vegetable he wants. And we're happy. And then for dessert, instead of having a whole big old bowl of something, now I have sweet potato and honey or maybe some blueberries. And he has one slice of pie instead of half the pie. And not only do we enjoy our food more, but, well, I used to weigh 220 pounds. <laughs> and when I weighed 220 pounds, I was so unhealthy, I couldn't dance anymore. Mm -hmm. I had a handicap placard so I could park in handicap parking. So I was so unhealthy. I was walking less, burning less calories, sitting around doing nothing and steadily putting more calories in my mouth. Yeah. And all, if I didn't make the changes when I did, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Yeah. I would be in the grave. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And I'm back to dancing again. <laughs> Yay, that's awesome. That is so amazing. That is so amazing. Uh, you know, one thing that I'm learning from you, Francine, is there are a lot of um, people, especially women, who um, are not loving themselves because they don't feel beautiful because they're overweight or obese or, you know, whatever those labels are that society puts on us and we take them on. And um, there is, um, you know, like literally billions of dollars being made by people trying to teach other people how to lose weight. And there's just so much focus um, on just losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. And a lot of uh, what I'm seeing also is that a lot of these methodologies that people are teaching and preaching, um, they might help you to lose weight, but it's usually like some kind of a short-term bandage solution. Yes. And most people are not able to even sustain the weight loss that they achieve because whatever they did to lose that weight, it doesn't address the underlying causes of... The root cause. Yes, just like what you were saying. And so your journey, uh, what you've been sharing, you you know, I'm learning that it's not just about... Like, if you were just focused on, I need to lose the weight, you'd probably still be in plenty of trouble right now. but that wasn't your prime focus 
uh, 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 that is just really awesome. <laughs> Tell, and I want to learn more from you about, you know, how you came to embrace your own true natural beauty and what that means to you beyond, you know, looking awesome. Well, I'm 59 years old, but I want to take you on a journey back to when I was eight years old. Mm-hmm. I come from a large, not, not a lot of people, large family, from a large family. Most of my family was overweight. Mm. I was the first eight-year-old on Weight Watchers. I remember growing up and my sister was real thin and she would get all the hand-down clothes and she'd have all these cool clothes for my cousins and she used to be able to swap clothes with her friends Mm. and I would have one or two, maybe three outfits because my mom had to go to a store and buy me the big kids' clothes. Yeah. And then I would always hear, you'd be such a pretty girl if you could just lose some weight. That stayed in my brain. The realization that even my family said that I'm not pretty because I'm overweight. They meant well. They didn't know. My mom tried to help me. She's the one who took me to Weight Watchers. And you know what that did? That made me scrutinize every morsel of food I put in my mouth. So when I wasn't on the diet, I went crazy because I wasn't on a diet. Yeah. So I wasn't being healthy. Yeah. I was trying to lose weight so I'd be a pretty girl. Mm. But it failed because I wasn't giving my body what it needed. Mm. I was following this diet that was what they told me I needed. Like you said, if you give your body what it needs, it Mm. will heal itself. Yes. And I have, when I learned that I had food sensitivities, it's, it changed my whole life, my whole perspective. All the things that I absolutely love that I thought I couldn't live without is what was causing my body distress. Mm. When I learned that and I changed my mindset from I want to lose weight to I just want to be healthy, that's when everything started to change. I, it, it was a long process, but I figured out what foods my body thrives eating. So now, like you were talking about cravings, now when I have cravings, I'll crave a bowl of blueberries. Or I ran out of beets and I didn't have beets for a week. I was craving beets and the, It wasn't in season and I couldn't get beets. I wanted beets. Uh, Just yesterday, I needed chicken. My body needed chicken because we're getting ready for a big dance um, show. So I've been putting in extra rehearsal time. My body needed that protein. And I could tell my muscles wanted protein. So I cooked some chicken. So like you were saying, when you clean your body, and you know how every type of food reacts in your body, then you can listen to those cravings. Mm. But when you crave a candy bar because you're lonely, that's not the kind of craving. That's not giving your body what it needs. That's putting a Band-Aid on a gaping gunshot wound. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> that is so true. That is so true. When I when I was a teenager, I had a two snooker bar habit every day on my way home from school. <clears throat> yeah. So when I say craving that candy bar, that yeah. was my decompress from school. Oh God, what's going to happen when I get home? Who's mad at who now? 
uh, and what's going to happen there. So I had that walk home from school and my candy bars, and that was my time. Now I meditate when I feel like that. Yeah, yeah. So how do you... um... feel beautiful um like what do you love about yourself that makes you feel beautiful that's actually a funny question because i don't know if you could see i have this big old scar from where a dog bit me and the first thing i thought is The character in my children's book needs to have a scar to let kids know that it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a public speaker. Last year, I was going through a series of contests. And I learned that people love the funny faces that I was making. I had a speech coach tell me, I had to stop making these funny faces that it was distracting. But then in the course of these speech contests and doing this funny speech, I learned that people put me in the same category as Lucille Ball. Now, how could I not think I'm beautiful and be in the same category as Lucille Ball? Now, I still have all these funny weird tics and looks and when I... Sometimes when I do funny characters, my mouth curls up weird, and I i am got all these, well, you know what this is. I was an aircraft electrician in the military. This is what happens when old mechanics stop turning wrenches. <laughs> so now, instead of looking at this as, oh, that's so ugly, I'm like, hey, I led a good life. Okay, the dog and I had a little accident, it left a little mark. It makes my funny faces even funnier. Because now that I understand my beauty comes from within, I don't care what people see on the inside because people see my energy, my loving energy, and my kooky funniness. <laughs> Yes. Ah. So how do you begin to help the the women that you work with also connect with these kinds of uh, aspects of themselves that make them beautiful, uh, especially for those women who are still right now not feeling good about themselves? The first thing we start with is taking an assessment of everything you've accomplished in your life. Mm. Taking an assessment of the times that you did feel beautiful. Because did you know that to feel something in the future, you had to feel it in the past, but your brain doesn't know the difference between reality and fantasy. You could fantasize that you're beautiful and your brain will start to believe it. Once you believe that you're beautiful, that beauty, that energy will flow out of you. So what I'm trying to say here is it's not what you look like. It's all up here. It's how you feel. Yeah, yeah. So start to think about what has made you feel good and sort of uh, build on that. Exactly. And if it's hard to remember, like when I was stuck in my yucks, when I was taking those handful of pills and I really, I, I had a rash all over my body and I walked with a limp and I hated my job and everything was miserable I couldn't think of anything that was good. Yeah. And then I started visualizations about what the future could be mm. and how good it was going to be. And slowly I started thinking, 
Well, what can I do to get there? Rather than worrying about not being there and mm -hmm. how I got in this position in the first place. Yeah, that is a very cool insight because um, I've been in the yucks and it's true when you are in the yucks, sometimes, not always, but sometimes you can be in it so deep that you cannot see anything good. I, I've been through that kind of phase where someone would ask me, well, what are you good at? And, uh, you know, I, I can't remember what was the context within which I was having this discussion with somebody. Um, I think it was in the context of like career counseling or something when I was in college and I was going through one of those um periods of being in the yucks and I was like I'm not good at anything I, I there's nothing because you know like one thing that I had um well this is something I very much appreciate about me now but at that time I couldn't appreciate it um is that you know my entire life you know I have had a certain love for learning uh, like a very curious mind and like I would read a little bit of this read a little bit of that and find almost every subject I would touch upon interesting but I could never stick to one thing in terms of oh this is the thing I love or this is so uh, you know and and consequently in terms of developing skills and talents I knew how to do a little bit of a lot of things but I was not master of any particular uh, skill or at least that's how I felt or mm. saw myself because you know it's like oh you're B grade at everything you're B grade at everything <laughs> um, now I can appreciate that first of all I was going through a journey of discovering lots of amazing things which was very enjoyable uh, as a journey in itself um, and secondly, that even being B grade at lots of things, it's like, wow, B, being B grade is still really good. I mean, by yes. definition, B is like a good grade. Yeah, when I was in school, I used to get mad when we worked on group projects to the point where I just did it myself so we would get an A. My husband said, you know that a B is a good grade. No, I need A's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know that's just part of, you know, I think what happens with society sort of um, teaching us about um, how to be successful. And unfortunately, some of the teachings are not exactly designed to help you live a more happy life. Yes, because uh, when you're in school, you're supposed to learn the concepts. Hmm. You're not supposed to learn how to take the test. And when you, all you do is worry about the A's, all you're worried about is taking the test, writing the paper. You're not worried about learning. Yes, that's right. That's right. You know, just recently, I've had the opportunity to sort of tutor somebody. Uh, they have, uh, their English skills are um, kind of weak right now. They're a recent immigrant to the U.S. And uh, I, I helped them get enrolled in some English classes. And this was like, I, I saw this person starting to get stressed about that they were not... Um, getting very good grades in the class because they're like you know it's all new for them and they're like struggling with the learning a bit and in the context of how I stepped in and I was like okay I'll do what I can to tutor and help and support you in your learning this I have been very conscious and I've been working on helping this person also have this mindset of you know we're not just learning for the sake of the grades and to pass the class to pass right. the class we're learning to learn for 
life. You know, we want to be able to speak the language better, more fluently, so that you know you we can have a better experience living here in America in terms of when we engage with other people and so on and so forth. And so focus on the learning and look at the progress uh, that you've made over the course of just the last few weeks and improving your uh, English speaking, reading, writing skills. So it's like by focusing on that rather than looking, worrying about the grades, it's so much um, happier. You hit on another key point there. Celebrate your success. If you keep saying, and I talk, when I uh, coach business owners, and I'm mostly a public speaking coach, but I also coach them on establishing their business, they look at, well, I'm not where I wanted to be. It's been a whole year, and I only have two clients. It's been a year and you have two clients already? That's fantastic. Look at, you built a website. Yeah. You didn't even know how to put a speech together and now you're up talking to people. You were afraid to stand up in front of 100 people and you overcame that. Don't say, I only have two clients. Say, wow. I did all of this and I have two clients now. What's next year going to be like? Yeah. Yes. Ah, oh, this is so much about mindset because oh, you just triggered a memory for me. Uh you know when I was starting my coaching training work, this was like wow, back in 2012. <laughs> so it's been a while. Uh, but I remember at that time, I, I because for me, um, this was like very new. Like I knew I had a passion. I wanted to do this work, but I had no uh, no experience with the business side of it. Certainly, I'd never um, got any kind of business training, etc. So I signed up to attend lots of different training programs and go to lots of different conferences and things like that. And I remember this one particular conference we were at um, it was with a coach for coaches who, was, you know, who trains and certifies coaches and how to, in, in becoming coaches. And um, I remember he, there was just like one conversation that we were having in a group and uh, um, I think at that time, I was like maybe a year in, it was like 2013 or so. And uh, he was asking us to share like what experience we had so far with coaching, like have you coached anyone at all or, uh, you know, whatever. And um, I was able to share and at that time, you know, um, um, I, I, I said, uh, I was like, yeah, you know, uh, so, so far I worked with about 30 people, uh, but I said, but most of those people were in the context of like this group, uh, uh, program that I led with this other person who actually did all the marketing to get like 90% of the people in the group. So, you know, like I was. <laughs> Uh, putting down the fact that I'd worked with 30 people already in the first year of my of my practice and he was like Samia stop stop so what so what if those 30 people were mostly in the context of that one group and somebody else did most of the marketing I mean you have so many people here who wish they could have produced the results that you did who could yeah. get somebody who is that awesome at marketing to, right? uh, you know, partner with them? Yes. Oh, that's true. Uh, <clears throat> so sometimes we, you know, we, we don't have proper perspective or enough appreciation for um, our own amazingness. Right. I find that all the time. 
especially like in, in the public speaking, I hear some amazing stories. Mm. And all they need to do is have more confidence in themselves to put down their notes yeah. and move a little bit mm. to stop looking down or up and give a little eye contact to know that they're the expert. And if you make a mistake, the audience doesn't care. If you make a mistake, make a joke about it. Make them laugh. One lady said, I could do that. I said, I hope so. I'm making a living doing it. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And that makes me think back to, you know, this whole concept of true inner natural beauty. Because when you feel beautiful in this kind of deep way, then it also helps you to be confident and just be more comfortable being yourself. It's yes. yeah. Yeah. Um in the 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 eight years that I've been in the public speaking world. Now I did it when I was 30 years old in college and I did a lot of public speaking in my 40s when I was in college, but I'm talking about the getting ready to be a professional. Mm. And I hid behind a lectern or I'd hide behind props because I didn't feel comfortable with my body and putting myself out there. Yeah. I wasn't comfortable in doing this because, oh my God, let's see this. And I had a coach make me uncomfortable about my weird eyes and my eyebrows going weird ways and all my weird facial stuff mm. until I realized that is what allows people to see me as a human and my own self. And that's when I learned how to capitalize on it. And I just became a humorist. So now when I make these funny faces, it's part of who I am. Yeah. And I don't have to hide who I am. I just let more of it come out. Yeah, yeah. And you stand out because of you being you. I mean, when, you know, the, the people who give you feedback like, oh, you know, your eyebrows are weird or don't make those facial expressions, this or that, they are... I mean, there's some standard that they're trying to mold you into. And I'm not saying that is a bad standard, but that can't be the only path to success or to being a great speaker. I mean, that's just one one way of being. Right. And there's no way everyone can fit within that mold. No way. I went to do a presentation and this woman called me aside and said, why aren't you wearing proper shoes? I'm like, I'm wearing shoes. What's wrong with my shoes? Well, you're supposed to be wearing pumps. You're supposed to be wearing heels. Why? Does a man stand up here in heels? Then why do I have to? And then, oh, I always love the, you need makeup. No, I don't. My skin is fine. I don't need makeup. Yeah. It's the makeup industry that tells you you need makeup. It's the shoe industry that tells you you need $300 pumps to look good. It's the fashion industry that tells you you need a $300 suit to be a professional. Mm. No. It's what's up here and what comes out of here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, California is a wonderful example of how, uh, like in Silicon Valley, Valley, where all yeah. the, uh, the a lot of the big tech companies are, and now there's this whole culture there of you know the tech startups and etc. They have created such a major shift in expectations and perceptions around 
what is acceptable and what is good even in the context of how you dress at work and dress to work, dress for work. And in fact, I was just recently reading an article about uh, the the shift has been so um, influential and seismic because, you know, you have basically the the richest people in the world now, some of them, um, they and they're dressing like super casual. They're dressing super casual. And now it's become fashion to be dressed more casually. And right. actually now I was uh, talking to somebody and they were saying that um, you cannot any longer assume that the best dress code for you to, like if you're going for job interviews at different companies, like make sure you do some research into that company culture in terms of uh, if you uh, to to see if you will fit in there and in the context of going to a to a, a job interview they were like don't take it for granted that wearing you know the old fashioned kind of you know suit and tie and formal wear that that would be the best and safest way for you to go because there are many 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 companies now that are that are deliberately shifting towards having more casual wear cultures because you know they want to promote that as a value of you know people being able to express themselves and be more creative be more comfortable and be more comfortable yes exactly and so um if that is important to you that's the kind of company you want to work for and uh, do some research beforehand and make sure that you're a good fit and um, even if you just are about i want to do the best at every interview i do do the research to see what kind of company culture it is and you cannot take for granted that the old standard is still the best uh, for every every place you go so well, what's funny, in 2001, I applied for a job as a mechanic. I wanted to move to Florida. Uh-huh. And my friend in Mississippi told me, oh, you could borrow my suit. I'm like, suit? Yeah, you got to put on a skirt and, you know, the, the pantyhose and the heels and, the, you know. I'm like, I'm going to interview to be a mechanic. You're going on a job interview. You have to wear a suit. Well, I didn't. I wore pants and a nice shirt and a vest and close, you know, just sensible shoes. And I got the job. And I later found out that had I dressed like that, I wouldn't have got the job because they would have assumed that I didn't fit in out there turning wrenches on an airplane. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so back to uh how critical it is for us to embrace our own inner beauty, yes. be comfortable and confident being your own self. Yes. <laughs> oh. and, and the key to doing that is you have to love yourself. Yes. For who you are. And if you don't, at the start, make up a story about how much you love a fantasy person and then s- slowly work your name into that story because the brain doesn't know the difference between fantasy and reality you could trick your mind and shift those neurons into loving yourself and then once you're able to get that feeling build on it Yeah, yeah. You make me think about one of my coaches um, that I worked with. And she had us envision our best self. So she was like, you have a best self. And I want you to envision you as your best self. However it is that you envision yourself at your very best. I I want you to like, you know, just like really sink into that vision and I want you to see 
what your best self looks like, what she sounds in my case, she what she sounds like, how she talks, how she walks. And I had this like really amazing experience in that context because in those days, you know, I was still a happiness expert in training, as I like to say, I was still working my way up uh, in terms of, you know, uh, being in control of my mental health and all that good stuff. And so these were things that I was learning and um, I had this amazing vision of my best self as me. Um, I saw myself in a meadow and I was like, skipping along in this meadow and my arms like swinging and every so often I'd go and like into a twirl. Well, um, I connected, I connected with my inner child. Yeah. And that is who, that is me. I have reconnected with that inner child and it serves me well because what does, before the age of seven, before you really get into the school, before you're programmed by society, what does a child do? They have fun and they love themselves. Yes. And that's the me I embrace. And that's the me that comes out to the world to help everybody else have fun. Yes, that's right. And I realize that's a lot of who my best self is too, that it's about letting that inner child free um you know uh, when i'm my best self my inner child is free and because you're so right you know as children we are experts at having fun we are experts yeah. at uh being in the moment um you know and 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 finding joy in little things i remember like as a kid um, you know, I was, until I was about eight years old, we were living in India and we were in a small town and, you know, my family, we weren't like particularly well off. We weren't poor, poor, but we, you know, we were a basic middle class Indian, small town Indian family. And one of the things that, um, you know, uh, what that meant was that I didn't own a lot of toys, for example. Uh, but there were things for me to play with everywhere. You know, we would go out and we would find sticks and rocks. Yeah. And play together, like with each other, in my case, with my cousins and my brother and sister, etc., and we found so much joy in that we didn't feel any sense of like, oh, we're poor or we're lacking in this or that. Those are um, judgments and perceptions that I came to later, actually later in life. And uh, that was when I started comparing my experience of living yes. as that child in the in small Indian town and that was after I had moved out of India and we went to the Middle East and uh, uh, we were living at that time in in Dubai which you know by my standards up to how I had experienced life to that point Dubai was very high tech and they had you know like tall buildings and 24-7 uh, running electricity and water and the uh, taps whenever you turned it on you know and all of that felt very new to us but also it was very like wow I didn't know you didn't know you were this. poor until you yeah. saw how everyone else lived yeah 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 and you know like when when we started going to school like my parents worked really really hard to get us admitted into a really awesome school over there and a lot of the kids who were there were much, much more well off. And so they had, you know, a different lifestyle that they they were used to. And I got exposed to for the first time in some ways. And um, so that's when the comparison started and, you know, realizing, oh, I didn't have this or I don't have that. But thankfully, uh, you know, uh, I have to give lots of credit to my parents. They helped me maintain proper perspective. <laughs> like, 
see you're 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 still happy you are so happy you can still be happy right it's not about you know how many toys you have or how fancy or this or that stuff is um so thank god for the wisdom that my parents had in that context so at least that's not one that's at least one problem i managed to avoid <laughs> well you know i told you that i connected with my inner child yeah. i did that in my 50s Ah, now before that, a coach who taught me how to be hypnotized mm. really affected me by saying, have fun like a dog. And if you think about it, dogs are always in the moment. Mm. You, you could go to the, the thrift store and buy them a 50 cent stuffed animal and that will be the greatest thing in the whole world because that's their toy but they can also go out into the yard and find a stick and run around with that for an hour yeah if you have that mindset to just have fun no matter what i get tired of hearing the people this town is horrible. There's never anything to do. There's no shows. There's no concerts. There's, or dur during the pandemic, I can't go bowling and I can't go roller skating and I can't go to the movies. We had so much fun just cutting a path around our house. And we had three dogs at the time. My husband, the three dogs and I would just walk around the house together exploring nature and playing with the dogs and even the cats. You know, you buy a cat a toy and what's their favorite toy? That empty box that you're getting ready to throw out. Take a lesson from our pets, people. Yes. Ah, oh, you just made me think about this amazing book. Oh, shucks but I might mess up the title of it. Oh, dear. Uh, it's something like um, how my cat saved my life. I got to read that one. Okay, it's something like that. It might not be exactly the exact title, but actually how the cat saved this person. It's like a real like autobiographical um, um book that this author wrote and what she was talking about is actually she was extremely depressed and uh, uh you know her, by observing her cat uh, and how her cat lived she actually learned some critical life lessons about you know just enjoying the simple things being in the present moment and things like that and those lessons and living into those lessons is what saved her life. My cat saved, oh, this is Philip. There, apparently there's more than one. <laughs> yeah, see, I might be misremembering the title, but that was the lesson. I remember. That is a wonderful that, lesson. Yeah. That is a wonderful lesson. Yes, we have so much to learn from our pets and every aspect of nature for that matter. There's. Right. They're just, they're just little angels that were sent here to teach yeah. us stuff. Indeed. Oh, my gosh, Francine, I've been having so much fun talking to you. Oh, wow, we've been doing this an oh, hour already. I know, right? Lost track of time. Uh, we're going to have to do this again. Yes, that would be so much fun. And you know what I'll do? Next time, I will tell you a funny story about the, the character in my children's book. My children's books are designed to teach kids how to quiet their minds, uh -huh. use self-reflection as a tool, and to embrace their inner beauty. Awesome. I that. My goal is to build strong female leaders rather than fix adult women later in life. Mm, I love it. I love it. Okay. So you'll be back. And just oh. right now, we will wrap up. And my last reminder to our uh, uh, audience is please make sure you check the show notes 
because I will be dropping Francine's links in there so you can connect with her and get more help and support whenever you're ready for it. And until we connect next time, I wish you lots and lots of peace and joy. <laughs>